So, um, my name is Ignacio Cases. I'm a PhD student at Stanford, uh, working, I'm a member of the Natural Language uh, Processing Group. Um, um, by the way, some, somebody yesterday um, asked me about the, the code. Uh, we have a GitHub uh, repo, so you can uh, please check it out, and we are uh, happy uh, um, um, uh, having you uh, taking an easy in all uh, uh, the core NLP tools, set of tools that we have for natural language processing. So um, at the Stanford, I'm um, uh, mainly working with uh, Professor Dan Juravsky on the task of uh, uh, predicting the future. And uh, with uh, Professor Christopher Potts, I'm very interested in uh, many of the challenges of uh, natural language understanding. And actually, what I'm going to present to you today is part of this background uh, knowledge that we need in our research uh, for uh, creating uh, systems that uh, actually understand uh, better um, uh, people, which is something um, yesterday uh, Mark Lieberman, his wonderful talk, uh, mentioned uh, this a period of the, you, you all know probably, of the AI winter uh, after the, uh, by the end of the 60s, after the uh, infamous Alpac uh, report. Natural language understanding, uh, it happened the same, more or less the same thing in the 70s with, uh, as, as you mentioned before, with lots of good uh, uh, promising ideas, but none of them realized. Uh, but I have to say that we are right now in a very exciting moment where we are starting to see many of those things actually realize. So it's a very, very, very exciting uh, moment for natural language understanding. So I encourage you to, to uh, work it, yeah, on it if, in case uh, uh, you are not already doing it. So understanding is needed. Uh, part of it is because there are a growing proportion of queries in many companies that require semantic interpretation. So users expect uh, this kind of understanding from from a system. This is true from, uh, this is actually uh, adapted from Bill McCartney. He's a researcher, uh, one of my professors and researcher at, at Google, and they have uh, continuously this uh, need for a semantic interpretation. Uh, because in many cases, conventional uh, approaches to information retrieval to keyword-based uh, uh, approaches are not sufficient uh, to satisfy, uh, especially as uh, Tiho was mentioning before, uh, yesterday uh, with those uh, natural language in, uh, uh, interfaces and, and, and this is a growing aspect, um, uh, we need this kind of understanding. One of the reasons is that, for example, we have a, a very good systems that understand or have some kind of understanding of natural language and they perform, pe perform well in some uh, tasks. Uh, in this case, Wolfram Alpha uh, is able to, for this arithmetic fragment of English that we are going to see a little bit uh, later, uh, it, 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 I mean, it, the result is great. Uh, it uh, interprets uh, the input very nicely, so it's doing the, the translation, and uh, it gets the denotation, the result, uh, um, uh, correctly, right? Uh, which states border California? So we get Oregon, Nevada, Arizona. Probably as some of you remember, um, uh, 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 in the early 80s, this was a, a major breakthrough with the work for, by Fernando Pereira, and the, uh, uh, the subsequent GeoQuery staff. So this is uh, actually is understanding. However, we have also examples where uh, with, um, and this is, the point is not to criticize Wolfram Alpha, but is to, to uh, actually make the point that this is difficult even for uh, simple questions, which US, uh, US states are islands. So the interpretation, notable islands, no results. Um, so I, I, I was guessing uh, uh, this morning with Jonathan, if uh, actually we, we would hope to not have here Rhode Island, for example, right? That would be uh, terrible. But we have other simple questions, as which US states border no US states? And the closest world from alpha interpretation is which US states border. Uh, so this is uh, it's a difficult task even for um, uh, um, simple questions. The way as a computational semanticist, the uh, way, uh, by the way, how, how many of you are actually working on natural language understanding systems? 
so uh, some of you. So um, this is going to be uh, familiar for you. The way as uh, computational semantics is we, we consider, we represent uh, a meaning is actually by a, a tuple, three, a, a triple of uh, um, values composed essentially by messages, which are typically utterances in, uh, in a natural language, uh, as English, for example. Uh, with those uh, utterances, which are the first element of this tuple, uh, by a non-deterministic, non and I'm going to explain why this is the case, a non-deterministic um, um, uh, semantic parsing approach, we get a semantic uh, representation, uh, which can be uh, in a query language like SQL or using lambda calculi or any other um, kind of programming language. It, it used to be Prolog. Uh, in this, uh, the examples I'm going to show you here is um, we are using Scala, which is a, a type, um, strongly type um, a language that runs on the JVM and with which we can do uh, functional programming. Um, these are, by the way, uh, discrete semantic representations. We are going to uh, just uh, have a glimpse at the end of the, of the talk to non-discrete, so distributed um, uh, word representations, which are um, right now at the center of the, of the these are hot topic uh, in research. So once we have uh, this semantic parsing, we are going to see some examples, but it's not deterministic. We have this semantic uh, uh, representation, and we can derive by an execution step that is deterministic uh, in principle, uh, a denotation, uh, which can be um, consulting a model or um, query to a database or knowledge base, or if you are interested in cognitive science, the mental status of the speaker, or even uh, any other kind of grounding in, in semantic grounding in the world. Uh, the reason I'm saying that this is mostly um, uh, deterministic is because there are some approaches now uh, which separate the concern um, they consider some cases of stochastic, uh, what they call the stochastic denotations, where you actually have a uh, denotation is a probability distribution. Uh, uh, so so um, those are pragmatic models that are, um, some of them are uh, um, uh, very interesting uh, work done by uh, Dan Lassiter and Noah Goodman at Stanford. Uh, but essentially, for our purposes here, those, this is an execution step that is uh, deterministic uh, once we have the semantic representation. So examples for uh, the messages uh, the, in the fragment of uh, arithmetic fragment for English, one plus two, uh, the semantic representation in Scala could be, uh, there are many more, but one of them could be add one and two, and the notation is, is three. Uh, um, but uh, as I mentioned before, this is a non-deterministic non step. Uh, one of the reasons is that in language we have uh, ambiguities. Uh, natural languages are ambiguous uh, in, in several senses. One of them, one of the, those senses is uh, ambiguity on, at the syntactic level. So in this case, we can have either a semantic representation, which are, is a valid semantic representation, add a negative two and three, uh, as you can see from here, and the denotation would be one, or another semantic representation, negative, add two and three, and the denotation, as you can see here, is, is very different, is minus five. And both are uh, perfectly valid semantic representations. Uh, um, another source of ambiguity is lexical ambiguity, uh, where we have one word, uh, we would need to disambiguate it. Uh, uh, crane can be either a bird or uh, a machine, and we have to uh, get some, um, uh, we have to disambiguate in some uh, way uh, while we are doing the semantic parsing uh, and decide that we have uh, one possible kind of uh, bird or uh, the machine. Um, more um, examples, two is less than three. Um, um, we can use this operator, but the main idea here is that the denotation can be uh, a truth value. So denotations are very different um, uh, objects in, in principle, as well as uh, we have semantic representations, which can be operators uh, with complex operations in the, in the semantic representation. Uh, with, uh, this is uh, the denotation. Um, the main idea is uh, for this 2.3, 
uh, composed out of a message, a semantic representation, and a denotation, is that we can derive from a given sentence a denotation, right, a meaning. Uh, but the, the way we actually uh, do this, we model this in, uh, uh, in linguistics is by using a, a principle that we consider that uh, is underlying uh, almost every possible field uh, in linguistics, which is the compositionality principle. This is um, um, stated, um, attributed originally to Frege, although there has been some dispute if Frege would actually uh, consider this to uh, uh, be right. But in, in any case, in the, one of the modern, there are several uh, modern uh, formulations. One of them is that of Barbara Parti, which is um, a mathematical linguist in uh, University of uh, Massachusetts. Um, importantly, the meaning of a sentence is a function of the meanings of the parts, so the meaning of the words, but very importantly, and the way they are syntactically combined. So uh, it is important to uh, realize that the meaning of a sentence is not only the meaning of the individual words, but also we have to take into account the modes of composition, uh, because that's crucial to, uh, to be able to uh, generate models. The, um, um, in a simple example, uh, to illustrate this is uh, the case of all linguists and engineers, which is equivalent to minus two plus three in our arithmetic uh, fragment. Um, we can have two uh, possible parses. Uh, we are going to focus on all. So we can have either all uh, linguists and engineers. We can construct these semantic uh, trees with uh, type annotation. Uh, it, the meaning of this sentence is that uh, uh, of a group of people where the linguists are old and the engineers can be there uh, young or old, um, which is equivalent to this one here, or could be either old linguists and engineers. This is a problem of, uh, uh, a well-known problem of scope. Um, um, uh, one of the interesting ideas is actually uh, in linguistics to use this kind of approach is to understand the scope and the scope uh, ambiguity, structural ambiguity, uh, like in this case. Okay. So, Good yeah. so, is there, can it be solved? Because like, in, you normally would assume, from world knowledge, that you know more older linguists than engineers, right? Engineers are generally uh -huh. younger, especially in the area. Uh -huh. I mean, is this something, would you use world knowledge for this ambiguation? Or would you use that's, that's a possibility. Yeah, definitely, that's a possibility. You would need, uh, we always need to um, separate concerns. In this case, the, uh, as much as context as uh, we can use, uh, uh, the better. Uh, it would help us disambiguating, but if you, if you don't have, I would say that the key idea is that if you don't have context available, you couldn't discern which one of uh, those are actually, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, but that's a very good question that is going to be related to uh, what we see um, uh, if we have time <laughs> in, the, in the continuous representations, uh, as uh, Firth was uh, making a point related to that. So um, if we want to actually learn how to derive uh, meaning from utterances, um, uh, this is a, um, a uh, important problem in uh, natural language understanding. And very recently, Percy Liang and Chris Potts uh, have been proposing um, a framework that synthesizes approaches. Uh, they, um, it's very interesting to me this uh, quotation where they consider that composi compositionality characterizes the recursive nature of our linguistic ability required to generalize to a creative capacity. So uh, compositionality they consider that is uh, essential for us to, to be creative uh, using language. And they separate concerns and consider that uh, learning details the condition under uh, which such an ability can be acquired from data. And they propose several possible, um, uh, a framework that considers several possible um, uh, varieties. We are going to see actually one of them. So essentially they are, um, um, this, uh, they are proposing that uh, we have a learning challenge of um, uh, learning compositionality. There are several possible ways, but uh, to me, one of the uh, crucial aspects in the last few years has been uh, uh, this proposal by Percy Liang, uh, learning in this paper, Learning Dependency-Based Compositional Semantics, where uh, Percy was proposing that 
uh, if you remember the, the tuple three we have from, with utterances and answers, the traditional approaches to these problems have been learning from utterances and logical forms that are um, uh, in, the, in, in a form of uh, annotated uh, data, which is extremely useful. Is the way we actually got uh, parsing working with the help, of, of course, of uh, uh, all the work done by, by Mark Lieberman at, uh, uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, because uh, having, having these annotated, uh, 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 these annotated banks is very important and we can, we can actually learn. But especially for l um, logical forms, these are extremely, extremely difficult to construct and uh, very difficult to maintain. Uh, so it's actually a, a problem to uh, have a large data set of uh, logical forms. It's, uh, it's just uh, very difficult. So one of the uh, uh, main uh, ideas by uh, uh, Percy Liang and his collaborators in that paper is that actually we can learn these logical forms, these semantic representations as hidden variables using utterances and answers, so pairs of uh, messages and, and denotations uh, as our training example. So if we have uh, questions like a state, uh, which is the state with the largest area in the US, and the answer Alaska. We have lots of them. Uh, uh, what are the movies where uh, Brad Pitt is the main character and the list of uh, movies here as an answer? Their proposal is that we can learn from these pairs the logical forms as hidden variables. And that's actually uh, something I'm going to, to show you here and a very simple example that how, how we can do this, uh, which is actually a structure uh, prediction uh, problems. We can uh, separate this in, into four pieces, uh, essentially an initial grammar that we have to refine during the learning. These are very large initially, and uh, the reason for this is that um, in our arithmetic example with one plus two, we all know what one is, what plus is, and what two is, but actually if we uh, when the machine to learn, uh, um, when the machine is initially seen is something like this. Um, uh, this is, uh, any of you recognize uh, uh, this is? Yeah, yeah this is a, a, yeah, actually Maya writing from uh, uh, southern Mexico and, and Guatemala. Uh, so this is basically um, uh, what a, um, a machine would say if uh, it's trying to learn uh, uh, actually to decipher these, these glyphs. This is exactly the same problem. Uh, so I'm telling you that uh, some of those uh, heads, uh, these are logograms, are numbers, and one of them is a, is a function, just to, to make the, the problem easy. Um, um, and the denotation, I can tell you that it is five. Uh, the question is that um, we initially have to guess that uh, this head is, uh, that's the help I'm, I'm uh, giving you a little bit, right? Is either add, sup, or uh, subtraction, or multiplication. This head can be either one, two, three. The, the idea is that, uh, and this one also, right? One, two, three. We have to, we have to actually learn uh, what are these values from pairs of uh, sentences like this and denotations like this. So if we have uh, different examples. In this case, we are uh, changing this one for this one and the denotation is different, uh, we still need to, to propose some values, right? We have another example where uh, we have the same head as uh, initially, uh, but this one is different to, to this one, but the same operation, uh, and the denotation is now different. Uh, uh, by using this method, we actually can end up uh, learning the possible values. Uh, in fact, uh, this uh, logogram is to be read shock in, in Mayan, which is to, to count, to, uh, to add, actually, numbers. Uh, this one is Chan, which is four. Hun, which is one. This is Cha, two. And this is Wak, six. So the system is able to, to learn these things, but it has to learn them. So it, it is... Um, it would not, I wouldn't consider that it's learning if we actually inject uh, these uh, values as, uh, if we provide the system with this mapping, which 
uh, it has been uh, a common case until 2005, uh, I, I think, uh, with uh, some proposals from Settel Moyer and, and Collins, how we can learn this lexicon, uh, which is one of the problems we have. Uh, but, but the idea is that we end up learning. So this initial grammar is refined during the, the learning process. We need also a feature representation of the data, uh, which I'm going to, to um, um, uh, focus a little bit. And then an objective function and um, an algorithm for optimizing the objective function, which are actually, um, uh, these are actually um, solved problems right now in, in machine learning for this specific task. Uh, the question is how we can we could uh, propose a feature representation of the data and uh, in order to filter efficiently initial grammars. Um, so for example, in Scala, we can use, in order to represent um, um, the uh, initial grammar, we can use this uh, GLL uh, parser combinator library from Daniel Spiwak. Uh, we generate from every possible, uh, in, in a given message, we parse and we generate every possible uh, function, uh, every possible class here. Um, uh, for every number, we generate all the possible denotations for those numbers. And then for that parse, that is, this, this parsing algorithm is able to uh, handle ambiguity. So we generate a stream of uh, success, uh, successes. Um, Every, every possible tree, um, I'm going to show you later, that we have lots of trees and we have to actually prune them. The, the classes that we are using here, interestingly, um, can be considered, and this is one of the nice features of using Scala, can be considered uh, to be an algebraic data type. So these are a combination of sum or coproduct uh, types and um, every, one of those uh, actually is a product type uh, resulting uh, from, from uh, combining these um, uh, types. And uh, this is very interesting because if we use algebraic uh, data types, those are defining an, um, an algebra, an initial algebra. And uh, we can consider that we can calculate the denotation from uh, this initial algebra by deconstructing uh, by uh, uh, breaking the tree uh, using just a single function, which is the catamorphism over that, uh, the carrier of this initial algebra. So by applying just a um, generic operation, we fold that tree and we get the denotation at the end. So, uh, and this is interesting to me because it's uh, somewhat related uh, uh, to this idea of uh, compositionally um, uh, building the denotation from this semantic representation. As Percy Liang and Chris Potts mentioned, compositionality outlines a recursive interpretation process in which the lexical items in, in this um, algebraic uh, data type in our case are listed as base cases and the recursive clauses define the modes of combination. In our case, again, we are capturing this with a full generic uh, transfer form uh, um, uh, with a folding as a generic transfer for any algebraic data type. So this is just the, the fold function for that tree. And with that, we are able, given a um, parse for that tree, we just fold it and we get the denotation. But we have lots of trees, right? Uh, the question is that, uh, as I, we mentioned before, for minus two plus three with denotation of one, we have lots of trees uh, because we, need to uh, actually provide every possible combination. So in this tree here, two is, uh, is one of the possibilities, and three is there. But this, you, if you look at this tree, two uh, is mapped initially to three, and three is mapped initially to four. Um, we calculate by folding these trees the denotations. We are going that, uh, to see that some of the trees, uh, they actually have correct denotations like these three here, but not those ones, right? So we are going to, uh, actually the algorithm is going to prune them, it's going to uh, filter them because they don't have the same denotation as we, we expect. The denotation for this sentence is, is one. So those are going to, uh, we are going to get rid of them. But as you see here, we still need, uh, if we only would have this uh, a simple example, we would end up having uh, different possible, uh, in principle, correct trees, right? 
So this is to say that we need uh, data and uh, especially uh, as much data as we have for these algorithms to learn well from pairs of utterances and denotations. So they are able, so the, the main idea maybe for you is uh, that they are able to learn the semantic representations, but we need data uh, uh, because precisely of this reason, right? To avoid, uh, to, to, to be able to learn this mapping because the mapping is highly ambiguous. If we can uh, implement a polymorphic um, uh, stochastic uh, subgradient descent in Scala, and the interesting thing here is using this transformation, the denotation function, as we were mentioning, is just the, this fold, um, and we just predict, and it's, it's very straightforward um, um, implementation of uh, the gradient descent for the perceptron. It's an extra structured per perceptron uh, algorithm, would, uh, actually, what we are seeing here. So we have some results um, uh, f with a very small training data set, like one plus one, one plus two, one plus three, and many others, and more complex. The interesting thing is that we are able to learn, like minus three, three plus two, is able to learn more complex things, like, uh, like minus two um, uh, plus three times four, let's say. But interestingly, uh, what we provided initially was uh, um, um, we, um, uh, we wanted to, to have some, um, um, uh, let's say, how, how to say this? We didn't provide a four initially in the training data set. So you are able to, so you can see that the prediction of the algorithm, he, the algorithm makes uh, the best guess it can, but it didn't see that four in the training data, so it's not able to. Uh, to actually uh, good ad uh, a prediction, right? So it's, it's not correct. But in general, I mean, if you have enough data, uh, these algorithms are working uh, extremely nicely and uh, is really, this is a very promising uh, avenue uh, for actually doing semantic parsing, for getting those systems that understand us and avoiding problems like we saw before in, in uh, the Wolfram Alpha uh, case. So these are, up to this moment, uh, discrete representations of data. You have a question? I'm just wondering about like interpolation versus extrapolation. Like what happens if it doesn't know that four is a part of its ecosystem? Like how does it, like, I mean, say if you're extending this beyond just numbers and some kind of concepts, it could probably guess location between a concept, but how does that know, how does it go outside of that location? So if you're applying this to like words, you create a word vector in case, Absolutely, that's, that's actually, uh, absolutely, absolutely. So th these are discrete representations. They have a uh, great value. Uh, my perspective is that we should be able to, to use discrete representations as maybe as a case limit, as we, maybe we, we can talk about this later. Uh, but this is very interesting. It's one, actually, one of the uh, limitations. We need to learn those um, uh, mappings to uh, those grandings to, to the lexical items, right? And that's a very complex, that's actually a research question, how we can do better. Uh, and you, you made this, this great point because, again, this is, the next step is actually uh, that we are working very hard right now is how we can actually use continuous uh, uh, representations, so distributed uh, word representations to actually elevate these kind of problems and do better in semantic parsing. So this is um, what we are working right now. I don't have code for this part of the, of the um, I, I would love to have the, the code already, right? This is part of my research for my qualifying paper. Um, uh, but w we are working very hard on this. So I'm going to um, give you a glimpse of um, uh, the ideas that uh, we are considering uh, to be able to learn uh, compositional semantics using distribu distributional uh, approaches. How many of you uh, went actually yesterday to Marek's talk? So, okay. Um, um, how many of you know uh, what word vector representations or distributed? Yeah, so most of you. Well, in any case, um, I just uh, very briefly, um, um, the distributional hypothesis and, and um, all the goodies that we are having from 
the deep learning come essentially from uh, several assumptions in or several uh, hypotheses stated in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, essentially by Selig, Harris, and Firth. Uh, Firth was making this famous quote, you shall know a word by the company it keeps, right? The, the idea is that the complete meaning of a word is contextual, and that if we know that context, uh, uh, we have to take into account the context, but if we know it, uh, uh, as Harris was uh, also making, uh, uh, pointing out, we, we actually are, uh, a, we can encode the meaning of the, of the word using this distributional approach. Harris mentioned that distributional statements can cover actually all of the material of a language, which is something um, is kind of controversial, and I would love maybe later to know uh, Mark your opinion on this. It's controversial. Uh, it's very interesting. I would say some people say or consider that with work they are able to learn most of it, but this is a controversial uh, aspect, right? We are considering this is and this for uh, maybe. Not for granted, but as a uh, assumption, general assumption in distributional uh, semantics. Um, Antonia Pantel mentioned that if units of text have similar vectors in a text frequency matrix, then they tend to have sim similar meanings, which is um, um, which are to me three of the pillars of this distributional approach. So, very um, in a very succinct way, um, if we consider uh, um, these nouns are represented as uh, vectors here. The first um, uh, element of the vector is a concreteness in this very simple example. Uh, the second one is, um, so this is concreteness. Um, I guess that this is, um, this is concreteness. This is another semantic feature, let's say, uh, um, a different semantic feature that we have for, for it, it's, it's not that relevant at all. Uh, initially, I'm, I'm very interested on those things, but uh, not, not for this problem. And the, and the last uh, element is a uh, bias. Um, there are, uh, if we consider the adjective uh, unpredictable to be represented by this matrix, we can formulate uh, uh, rules like uh, adjective noun composition as a matrix vector uh, multiplication, right? And uh, if we feed um, nouns in a neural network, we can consider that uh, w the adjective uh, um, uh, multiplications in, in, in the weight learning. And uh, we apply the sigmoid, and we get uh, in, in this initial layer um, a function that is, interestingly, of the same semantic type, uh, a vector that, or in our case, a number, but in, in, in general, can be a vector that, uh, importantly, is of the same semantic type as the uh, uh, um, uh, the other one. So, in this case, we have a noun adjective uh, composition to give a noun phrase. Uh, this would be of the same semantic type, and this is important because they can compose. We can we can uh, then use these systems initially to to learn compositional semantics. But this is the research question. So, it is interesting by itself. Because by doing this, for example, we can um, understand this very nice phenomenon that uh, unpredictable um, is not the same to say uh, uh, it, it, we are not. It has not the same meaning when we say an unpredictable uh, movie or even an unpredictable roller coaster, uh, which are uh, aligned along this axis, which could be uh, considered to be uh, good. Uh, aspects of a movie or a roller coaster, but definitely I wouldn't like to use an unpredictable website or an unpredictable plane, right? And they are aligned along this uh, axis. So um, by doing this matrix vector uh, multiplication, uh, this model is able to actually learn this kind of um, uh, difference in meanings for uh, an adjective that the surface form is the same, but the, uh, end up, the, the end meanings are very different. So that's one of the reasons why these approaches are extremely uh, promising. There are different uh, architectures for uh, composing distributed representations. Uh, one of them is algebraic composition, um, where we have the, the ways we combine vectors uh, can be either um, following a general ad addition law 
or a, um, an addition or a general addition or multiplicative tensor. People have been using many or proposal, uh, proposing many different uh, operations for this uh, compositional uh, function. Um, there are also uh, other models, the parameterized composition or lexical function uh, uh, composition, and especially this model, the mathematical foundations proposed by Kuka et al. Uh, using a, a category theoretical approach. Uh, basically, they are able, to me, the, the interesting aspect of their proposal is that uh, mm -hmm. they are able to, uh, using uh, one category, uh, they can project Montagovian semantics in a discrete basis, or they can uh, also get distributional uh, semantics by projecting the same, uh, the same uh, underlying vectors in a, in a different uh, basis. So this is very promising. The problem is that it's very complex and we don't have implementations. So to give you an example, four, the uh, word four, uh, it has to be considered as a five, uh, a tensor of uh, um, order five in this model, which ends up, um, if we, we want to implement a model of a very simple sentence, the vector representations that we end up having are extremely, extremely large. I mean, the um, 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 number of uh, um, um, dimensions is extremely large and it's not computable. There are uh, a third approach uh, in, from this architecture perspective, which are the recursive composition uh, that brings up all the neural networks uh, families. Like the recursive neural networks, recurrent uh, LSTMs or convolutional neural networks, and I have to say that to me, um, again, this is a very uh, this is a, 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 this is the research that we are doing in uh, right now. Uh, which models, uh, which architectures do we need? What, what kind of uh, compositionality we can learn from these models? Um, to me, convolutional neural networks are extremely promising because of the fact that they are able to model um, non, um, non linearities, even if the convolution in principle is a linear uh, operation in, in the transform uh, space. But to me, uh, dynamic convolutional neural networks, which are uh, non linear, are very promising, extremely promising. But I have to say that the, the, the hero in, in uh, all this is actually um, uh, Sam Bowman, uh, is one of my colleagues at Stanford, and he has been able to show that we, that, uh, we are actually able to learn logical semantics using recursive neural networks. So this is, to me, uh, actually a, a huge success because it's one of the very, very first um, uh, results applying um, deep learning techniques uh, on distributed world representations to actually learn uh, some aspects, still some aspects of uh, compositional um, um, uh, semantics. Um, again, this is um, the, uh, I would say, one of the hottest topics of research in natural language understanding right now because if we are able to uh, uh, get good results, uh, we will be able, again, to model uh, compositionality and, uh, from a quantitative uh, perspective, and therefore we would be closer, one step closer. Maybe this 1% you were mentioning yesterday, uh, Mark, um, uh, to this promise of having better understanding uh, systems. That's all. Thank you. I think we have one minute for a question. Yeah, right. um, have you have you had like have you? Uh, this is the guy that seemed to who did uh, semantic compositionality using uh, uh, categorical combinatory grammars. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. Is, it, is there something like what would be a difference, like a, a quick difference between like using a, like a recurrent neural network for uh, learning semantic compositionality versus something like the CCG? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a good question. CCGs are a formalism with which you can actually uh, propose uh, discrete representations. Uh, so for example, 
Um, if you use Lambic Calculus, which is um, 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 an extension of which, um, um, basically, you, you, can, you can use Lambic Calculus in combination with categorial, uh, combinatoric ca categorial grammars. Um, you can create these distributed representations, uh, these uh, uh, discrete representations, and you can use any kind of uh, um, uh, algorithm that we talk in the first part of the of the talk, right? Uh, like Settelmoyer and Collins, for example. Actually, they use in 2005 they use a probabilistic uh, parser using combinat uh, categorical combinatory uh, uh, combinatory categorical grammars CCGs uh, with very good results because they were actually the first ones being able to, as far as I know, to learn the lexical items, um, uh, this mapping, this initial mapping, uh, in the initial grammar that we were mentioning uh, in the beginning. So I guess that they are not, uh, they are not um, uh, orthogonal approaches. Um, the group, uh, so Bob Cook uh, and uh, collaborators, the people from Oxford, they are using this, they are proposing this, um, framework, category theoretical framework, which actually um, when you um, want to model the uh, relations and the syntactic relations between in a, in a sentence, they use uh, categorical grammars or some kind of. So um, I guess that they are not orthogonal approaches. Um, Oh, uh, so could you elaborate more on the scaling? Like, how, like, as you're adding additional representations, how, would this, how does it scale, like, in kind of big O style? And then are these representations dense or sparse? And is that? You mean in, in, the, in the distributional, um, in this distributional approach? Yeah. I mean, could you talk about how, when you add the concept of four, that it, or I'm missing No, I mean. I, I don't know if you mean in the distributional approach or in, in the discrete. In the discrete. In the discrete. Uh, well, um, I would need to look for the the, the O N of the. I mean, the, the order of, uh, uh, of the complexity of the of the algorithm. Um, scalability is one of the of the issues that we we actually have. This is something I discuss a lot with uh, people that are working. Um, uh, uh, in some companies in, in the Bay Area, because they wanted to use these approaches, but this uh, is, I would say, it's a technical concern. The problem, so the GLL algorithm, for example, the complexity is n cube, right? The problem is not the the uh, per se the, the that complexity, but the the huge number of uh, possible parses that you generate. Uh, uh, depending on on the on your task, that depends on your task because you are defining the number of lexical items, right? So I would say, just maybe to to give you a short answer, the complexity is always the same problem that we have. But uh, in addition to that, we have the uh, combinatorial exposure of uh, possible parses, which is the Catalan number of more than no, is is the number of lexical items times the Catalan number, which is more than exponential. So. That's that's why we we need to do like good job trying to refine the 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 size of the initial grammar. That's a good point. Yeah. Can you uh, briefly describe the training for Sanborn's research? Like, is that unsupervised or supervised? Uh, it's unsupervised. Um, as far as I um, I know, uh, it's unsupervised. Uh, uh, In the in the case of uh, that I showed here, yeah, the the the, the so n it's not actually sentiment. It's um, that's a good point, uh, the, because this is actually a, a toy example, right? Um, you get basically a, um, a value, yeah, zero to one, where um, um, that's a good point. I wouldn't say this is sentiment. Yeah, this is over a thousand yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a good point. I'm going to, to ask Chris Potts what is his opinion, but yeah, no, I, yeah, I wouldn't say it's sentiment. Oh, so we have. The composability, the example that you use for a tree and couples, do you see that this composability may work in the case of 
to start graph, we can break the graph, that kind of things like this little notes like it building from a lexicon terms to a phrase, the phrase to a sentence. Uh -huh. Do you see more like a more flexible data structure, more like a subgraph within a graph instead of trees and couples? Well, that's a, that's an extremely good question. I would say that um, if we are able to model, um, I mean, the, the reason for trees is because of our tradition in Montagovian uh, approaches, uh, where we uh, are able to explain uh, a big amount of the semantics of uh, um, many languages. Uh, Co by composing uh, using uh, semantic trees, right? Um, I would say that I, I, I would be totally open to any other kind of graph that is uh, able to capture uh, the same amount of information. Like in, in some of those models, we would end up having uh, maybe non-tree structure. If they, they, we, we may discover that they perform better. So that would be actually very, uh, very interesting. Uh, it's like obviously a more flexible data structure may add great data to the world and some semantics that a tree find difficult to. Yeah, I mean, um, actually, one of the the um, we we are using probabilistic graphical models uh, to model semantics and pragmatics also, right? So these are the case of some uh, other kind of graphs to that, that have this ability. So I wouldn't be surprised if that would be the case, but our initial approach is to, to model in the traditional uh, way. But that's a good point. Uh, thank you.